Good evening, everybody. I'm Sarah Worthington. I'm a pro-director here at the LSE, and it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's event. Uh, this event kicks off uh, the lecture program at the LSE for the summer term, and um, I'm very pleased to say that Urban Age, together with the support from Monocle and the Cities program in the Sociology Department, has invited the architect Alejandro Aravina to London as part of the ongoing public events at the LSE. I had the very good fortune to see Alejandro's presentation of Elemental's work in, uh, in the Urban Age Conference in Sao Paulo last year. As many of you know, uh, Deutsche Bank's Alfred Herrhausen Society has initiated a program called Urban Age. Uh, which investigates the connections between the physical form and the social characteristics of cities. And since 2005, Urban Age has produced important research and high-level conferences in cities as diverse as Johannesburg, Mumbai, Shanghai, London, New York and Sao Paulo, with heads of state, city mayors, architects, sociologists, economists, and other scholars and urban decision makers attending. What Urban Age aims to do, and I think in fact is doing quite successfully, is influence the debate about the future of our cities. Alejandro Aravina presented at the San Paolo conference and I was impressed, very impressed with what he had to say. So with the backing of LSE people I invited him to come and he is here person furthest away from me. Alejandro's work stands out for its ability to improve the quality of life in cities. He works for a firm Elemental that demonstrates that an understanding of the city as a, limit, as a resource to build social equity. He's a Chilean architect a professor at the Catholic University in Chile, executive director of Elemental, and what he will do is explain how his firm addresses questions outside the traditional realm of architecture. What he does is focus on the design and implementation of urban projects of social interest and public impact. Elemental bases its work on three principles. They want to think about and design and build better neighbourhoods and the housing for those neighbourhoods and the infrastructure so that they can help promote social development and overcome the circle of poverty and inequity in our cities. And it was on one of those d design projects that uh, Alejandro presented at San Paolo. They want building projects to be built under the same market and policy conditions as other developments. What they want to do is achieve more without it costing more. Do the same with less or do, the, do more with the same amount of input. And thirdly, they don't want design to be a social expense. They want it to increase in value and provide returns on the investment over time. And that is a demand that not all uh, social developments deliver on. In addition to Elemental's urban projects and social housing developments, Alejandro's recent work includes new facilities for um, St. Edward's University in Austin, Texas. And that includes the Texas Mathematics Faculty. And then at the um, Catholic University in Santiago, he's done the medical faculty and the Siamese Tower and the Architecture School. And uh, just, this, uh, just this year, he was uh, elected as a member of the jury of the Pritka Prize. As you will know, that is architecture's highest honor to get that prize. Beyond the jury is no doubt a singular achievement. I also want to say something about the other speakers, but the way we're running tonight is Alejandro will talk to you for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have um, some comment on what he has to say and a discussion with the other speakers. So tonight, the other speakers, I'm delighted to welcome next to Alejandro, in the middle of this three, um, our chair for tonight, Tyler Brule. 
He's the chairman and editor-in-chief of Monocle and a columnist for the Financial Times. I was rude enough to say I only know him as the uh, writer of Fast Lane, but he's here uh, in his role as uh, chairman and editor-in-chief of Monocle that is sponsoring this event. He was born in Canada but has been based in the UK for the past 15 years. He began his career as a reporter for the BBC, then he launched Wallpaper magazine, and then he established a branding and design agency. And two years, late, two, two years ago, he launched Monocle, which is an international media brand now, with offices in London, New York, Zurich, and Tokyo. And what Monocle does is provide a global briefing on current affairs, business, culture, and design, and an annual guide to the world's most livable cities. And I had Tyler tell me today, that uh, this evening, that they're changing the criteria. So you can expect the list of the world's most livable cities to change slightly next time it's released. And then next to Tyler, um, immediately on my right, is Ricky Burdett, who's the director of Urban Age, a group that I talked about earlier. He's a centennial professor in architecture and urbanism at the LSE and the founding director of the LSE's new Centre for Cities. Uh, the Centre for Cities is a research centre which explores the links between architecture, urban design and urban society. And that centre is connected with the LSE's Cities programme, uh, a teaching programme, MSc programme, um, that aims to give both architects and non-architects some exposure to the sorts of issues that uh, will be in focus this evening. Ricky is the architectural advisor to the city of Geneva and he became the chief advisor on architecture and urbanism for the London 2012 Olympics. Before that he was the architectural advisor to the Mayor of London from 2001 to 2006 and he's curated numerous exhibitions including one you might have seen uh, global Cities at the Tate Modern. He was also director of the 2006 uh, architectural Biennale uh, event in, ben in uh, Venice. So, a good group to uh, entertain us this evening and I'm going to hand over to them and we'll start with uh, Alejandro. Thank you so much for this invitation. Um, as uh, Sarah very precisely already pointed out, uh, what we're trying to achieve, this presentation will try to explain how we're trying to achieve those goals, to just uh, explain. Can we turn off the lights? Or lower it, please? I'm here uh, as part of a group called Elemental, uh, which we call a do tank, uh, which is a for profit company. So it's a for-profit for company with social interest partnering with the Chilean oil company, Quebec, and the Catholic University. We're a group of architects and engineers uh, that try to use the city as a shortcut towards equality. We are, above all, designers. And what I'm going to try to explain today is what's the connection between the specificity of our tools and our practice and how that connects with non-specific issues like cities development, poverty, and that type of issues that have been broadly discussed in urban age conferences, which I had, uh, I was lucky to attend for the first time in Sao Paulo last year. I would like to show a few images of a way, the way we approach design in general, not just social housing, where by no means are social housing experts. Uh, we're just designers. And I would like to use an example that is outside architecture to actually explain our attitude towards design 
and try to explain what we're trying to achieve. Imagine we're asked to design a chair. When I thought that the most simple de design for a chair is this, I saw this. This is a chair. Three things can be said about this chair uh, of this Indian from Paraguay. First, this man cannot afford anything but this modest piece of, of cloth as a chair. So, to know how to design and the scarcity of means is relevant. Second, this man is a nomad. So, even if he had more money, any other design for a chair makes no sense. Design has to be precise. Finally, this design for a chair represents a kind of ultimate limit. You cannot keep on taking things out from this design because what you get is not the noun chair anymore, but the pure verb to sit. So design has to be irreducible. What we do can be explained by the following equation. The piece of cloth is to a chair as x is to architecture. Our work is to try to find the most precise, the most relevant, and the most irreducible value for x. This is particularly necessary, not really a choice, in other type of designs, like in the uh, buildings for university, might be a choice, is not really a choice while working in social housing and while working in urban projects in Chile, where we started. What we're going to take a look at today is this project over here, our first project at all, started in 2003, as a consequence of a lot of design workshops that we developed at Harvard University and Universidad Católica in Chile. Eventually, I'm going to show some pictures that simultaneously were developed. While we were building, we decided to run a world competition to try to cover more cases uh, and more uh, conditions to try to give an answer within the existing public policy for social housing in Chile. So some of those uh, are now being built. I'm going to show some photographs of, of those. And I'm going to start just to prove that from this point on, we started to have more projects in Chile and, out, and outside Chile, but mainly we, just, we started to develop projects in the city that tried to make this shortcut towards equality, that are non-housing, projects of infrastructure and pro projects of public space. The first one is the one commissioned very recently by the presidency of Chile, to celebrate the bicentennial, the celebration of the 200 years of independence of Chile, which is a public space that there is not in Santiago, a continuous pedestrian promenade at the very base of the Metropolitan Park in Santiago, a very big park, 600 hectares, but that has no continuous pedestrian way uh, to have this um, public space that can be enjoyed by everybody. It is a very, one of the things that uh, defines very much Santiago is that a very unequal city. So public space is a way to uh, upgrade the quality of life of people and we're working on this project trying to achieve that. It's an old canal that we're trying to transform in this continuous 10 kilometer promenade that we don't have now in Santiago. It should be done by 2000, by the end of the year, and we were commissioned this a couple of months ago. So we're building at the same time we're drawing, in a way. So that's public space. But then using the 
public concession system of the Ministry of Public Works, we're also working on infrastructure, public parking, and then some connections to give access to the financial district of Santiago that ha is having very complicated uh, traffic problems. And again, not going to go into the details of it, but being one of the founders of Elemental, Andres Jacobelli, a transport engineer, this uh, seemed to be a natural uh, consequence of uh, where to go after housing. But the main presentation of tonight is going to be about what we started to do back in 2001 with social housing. If I have to synthesize two, seven years of work in two points, I would say the following. If there was enough money, middle income class would get this type of house, let's say 80 square meters. By that I mean, and I, have to, I will try to explain the context I'm coming from uh, while I'm presenting the, the slides. Middle income in Chile means that this house should cost about $30,000, $40,000, more or less. Uh, it has part of subsidy, but it's mainly acquired through uh, a credit, a private credit in the, in, with banks. But if you get money, what you get is this. If there's not enough money, which is the case in social housing, what the market does is to produce the same house, but smaller, 40 square meters. Actually, and this is already a luxury, and we're working beyond, uh, b below that line. So we thought that instead of doing a small house, what if we consider 40 square meters as half of a good house? So this, I would say, was our, our first point, to understand that when there's not enough money, so that you, don't have, you can't afford too many square meters, those, let's say, 40 square meters can be seen as half of a good house instead of a smaller house. When you get money for half of a house, the key question is, which half do you do? With public funds, we decided to do that half that a family will never be able to achieve on its own. Here is a list of the sign conditions that we identified that belong to that half that very uh, difficultly or without enough quality will be able to be achieved individually by a family over time. I'm going to give specific examples on this, but this is one point. The second one, as Sarah mentioned in the introduction, is that we thought that houses shouldn't be like cars, that un and which unfortunately is the case with social housing in Chile. Housing units that cost $20,000 five years ago now are traded, are, are sold or purchased for $100. So that has produced that housing is seen as pure social expense and all of us when buying a house expect it to grow to it to have this house grow value over time so almost by definition it could be seen housing as an, in, an investment and we thought that there, there was no reason why social housing shouldn't be treated the same way so we identified a set of five design conditions that can guarantee at least with more certainty, that houses will grow value over time. If you see, those are the same fine design parameters that belong to the, ha to the half of the house that families won't be able to achieve individually. More context. As Sarah said, in 2001 at Harvard, we decided to try to do something with social housing. And that something could have been uh, an exhibition, a book, but my partner, uh, Andres Jacobelli, an engineer, said that if we want to have an impact, we should build. That's why I think we called Elementale Dutank. Let's do something. In, um, we, we will find out what to do while doing, but let's do something. And two conditions have to be followed. We have to accept every single market and policy condition so that if we eventually find a point, it can be replicated. 
Those conditions were, until 2001, a subs let's say a voucher of $10,000 that was composed by a government subsidy of $3,000, then family savings, and then a private bank loan. With that, units of about 40 square meters were able to achieve, to be achieved. In that year, policy changed, and it was a good coincidence that we started working in a moment where a new policy was coming out, so the market had no answer for that new policy, and we were told by the minister if, they, if we wanted to do any contribution, we could be in that new policy that we were about to launch uh, in 2001. That new policy was, they eliminated the private bank loan, actually doubled the direct government subsidy, maintained the family saving, but because there was no debt, the final amount of money, even though the subsidy was doubled, the final amount of money was less than what we had before, $7,500, which in the best of the cases meant around 30 square meters. The reasons for this change are very important. On the one hand, families were not paying back this loan over here, so there was an invisible subsidy of the government that was not sustainable over time. The quality of the units was so bad, and that was fair enough in a way, that fa families were not paying this loan back. But there was another reason. The, the policy was not able to focus effectively on the poorest, because the poorest is not that don't have an income, they do not have a regular income. That's why are not, they are not eligible to a private bank loan. So trying to eliminate that was trying to um, be sincere about the subsidy that was able to be done. Actually, the capacity of doubling the subsidy was taking from not having to spend administrative stuff and uh, all the administration time in trying to get the loans paid back. And this was a way to improve the, the subsidy without sacrificing units built per year. We are talking about 100,000 subsidies per year in a country of 4 million families, which is a huge achievement uh, that we've been having as a country in the last two decades. So, <clears throat> in the end, this was our set of rules that we decided to accept. Within that, we were asked to find the solution for a project that for the last 30 years had found no solution in a city in the north of Chile, in the Atacama Desert, called Iquique. And the equation we were asked to solve was to find the solution for 100 families within the same site that they've been occupying for the last 30 years, a site that was half an hectare big, 5,000 square meters, using the $7,000 subsidy, which in the best of the cases can afford 30 square meters of built space, built space in an initial phase. This was the neighborhood that we were dealing with, a hundred families in this half an hectare site with very poor living conditions, not just environmentally speaking, but also pro very hard problems of drug dealing. But even though the living conditions here were very bad, the city around was highly desirable to be maintained for those families since they have built all the networks, social network uh, works, education, health, uh, transportation, even recreation around that spot in the city. This highly desirable city and network of opportunities around the site actually was identified already by the, bar by the market. The, size, the site cost was three times more what social housing can normally afford. So <clears throat> we decided to start a process of engaging with the community in trying to find the solution. We, of course, coming from outside uh, the world of social housing, uh, we were so ignorant that we even didn't even know what a subsidy was. And eventually our ignorance was allowed us to move forward. And we were trying, in a way, explain the families, but also ourselves, what our possibilities were. This PowerPoint is exactly the same we presented to the families, just not in English. 
We were, as I said before, everybody said, yeah, you know, but families are expecting an isolated house within the law. That's what they've been dreaming their entire life. So any other possibility, forget about it. So we made that exercise. Okay, what if we try to give you an answer with this? That is, might be what you're expecting. Well, only 30 families can be accommodated in the site. And if you find the way to choose who those 30 are going to be and who the 70 families that will have to leave are, then maybe you can uh, go move on forward on your own. You don't need us in that case. That is partly true uh, because with 30 families vouchers, we weren't even able to buy the land in the city center. But even if we imagine that we got the land for free, the problem with isolated units within the lot is that they're unable to control and guarantee quality of space in the future. Actually, somewhere here you see the roofs of those, of those initial units that had been eaten by uh, self-construction. And we were working in a niche where at least half of the surface was going to be self-built. And the quality of the neighborhood goes down and the value of those properties goes down with the quality of that neighborhood. So at least one of the conditions uh, of that we were trying to follow, the, one, of those five, one of those five that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, was not being able to be achieved using this. So this was not an alternative. We then showed to the families uh, the exercise following the row house type that it's proven by the market by reducing the width of the lot until making it coincident with the width of the house and even more with the width of the room. We're talking about three meters here for the width of that house. Sixty families could be accommodated, still not enough. But the real problem with this is that whenever you want to expand, and here you would like to expand your house at least two times what you get at the beginning, you have to either you have to block kitchens and bathrooms or circulate through other rooms. So instead of efficiency in the use of land, what you get is overcrowding. This was not an alternative. Last. Uh, typology available out there in the market, the high-rise building called the block. Well, families said that if we, if we even dare to propose this as a solution, they would go to hunger strike. <laughs> <coughs> and the reason is that the need for space in buildings has to be achieved by performing very uh, uh, unsafe structural uh, openings in the walls, and it's, a, it's being Chile a seismic country, this is going to be a major problem uh, when the earth, e next er earthquake comes. Still, we were able to feed these families with 100 units. But, well, of course, uh, families were right, this was not an alternative. <coughs> so we thought that Maybe the problem was the way we were framing the question. Because what we were trying to do is to achieve the best possible $7,500 unit and the, repeated it a hundred times, which was this case. So we reframed the question and asked ourselves, okay, what is the best $750,000 building uh, that we can achieve? And ask this building a set of conditions accommodate the 100 families, and mainly accommodate their growth. The problem with building, as we just saw, is that buildings block expansion, high-rise buildings block expansions. And that's true except in the ground floor that can always grow horizontally onto the land that hits uh, close to it, and then vertically into the upper last floor. So what we did was to do a building that had only the ground and the upper floor. We moved the building across the site because the size of the units was so small, we were trying to achieve at least 50% of the urban front to try to guarantee some quality into the future. But also, we were trying to use this initial box whose structure we were responsible for 
to try to provide the structure for the final scenario and the voids then had to be completed performing low-tech operations and in general operations that, can, that didn't compromise the security of the entire building. As you might remember from the list, structure for the final stage, not for the initial stage, was one of the conditions that cannot be achieved by a family and has a big impact on the value of the property, the final value of the property. So with this typology, we were expecting to fill in the voids afterwards with self-construction. At the urban scale, we went to four smaller courtyards, uh, each of them with individual access, and this actually was not our idea. We thought at the beginning that with this scheme, we would have liked to have all the buildings in the perimeter and create a big space in the center. Families said that, you know, we're not a group of 100 families. We're smaller than that. We're just together because we're trying to solve our problem. But the scale in which we can achieve agreements and we can sustain those agreements is smaller than that. And actually, it's around 20 families. With 20 families, if we decide to control the entrance over here and not let's say duplicate the key and guarantee security which was a main issue because of the drug dealing that was, uh, was the phantom of the drug dealing uh, before. That type of uh, subdivision in size of social units was guided by the community itself uh, where to park cars or how to uh, make the self-construction. Are we going to have fences? All that type of uh, decisions can be maintained in a smaller size. What I want to show here is the next slide, which is the lot structure. The size of each house uh, lot, which is a square. I want to explain this because I think here is a very, a very specific example of how architecture engages a non-architectural issue. Actually, uh, some time ago I gave a conference in Spain that was called that uh, the square was more efficient to overcome poverty than the rectangle. Such a statement was based on the fact that whenever we consider a notion of efficiency in, in urbanizing a piece of land, we try to achieve narrow lots with as much depth as possible. For a given size, let's say 100 square meter of a, of a lot, the less width and front it has and the more depth for that given area, the more efficient because you have to build less pipes, less street, so in, in general less services and infrastructure to serve more families. So under a conventional notion of efficiency, Rectangle, rectangular, narrow lots are better. A square lot, from that point of view, it's more inefficient. But in this case, we've got a site that had a very uh, articulated perimeter. So we needed to rotate a lot of times, unlike any conventional block where you have a more or less regular figure. In this, house, in this case, since we were in the middle of the block, we had so many corners that we needed to rotate with the property many times. And we know from our training in School of, of Architecture that a square is a figure that is more able to uh, cover a given surface, a given area, uh, because it can rotate. You don't lose all those slots when arriving every time to a corner, which is in a conventional uh, uh, block the case. By being able to develop a square lot, able to accommodate better to each corner of the site, we were able to accommodate more families than what we have done, uh, would have been uh, done with rectangular lots. And more families, in this case, meant more subsidies. More subsidies meant enough money to buy the land and still have some money left to do the construction. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, the translation into a specific design of the general principle of having a house underneath and an apartment on top was the same 30 something square meter unit, initial unit, in this case six by six in a nine by nine lot, <coughs> multiplied as you saw in the previous slide many times in the given site, 
Then a concrete slab uh, that we, did, we called uh, an horizontal partition wall. And on top of that, apartment duplex of six meter wide in two stories. So again, three by six, which is 18 square meters in two floors, 36. Both apartment and house underneath can achieve a final growth uh, a level of 72 square meters that we knew from what we were uh, studying is the size in which a middle income family uh, stops its expansion process. In terms of rooms, we were trying to achieve full bedrooms of three by three, which by no means was the case in the public policy in Chile at the time. Direct access of each unit to the public space, enough evidence out there that common spaces, elevated sidewalks, not to talk about elevators, cannot be maintained in such poor environments. The moment you cannot pay for the maintenance, you enter in a spiral of the deterioration that we wanted to avoid. So every single uh, element of the housing units had to be of individual responsibility. And in the voids, the growth. Well, we had to explain this to the communities, and I have to confess, we were, this is my partner, uh, we were very nervous because we had no B plan if families didn't accept that as a solution. Uh, to our surprise, it took them about three seconds to accept our proposal because we didn't invent anything. They themselves were not 100 families 30 years ago, were only 50 families that after a while built an apartment on top that rented to a second generation of illegal tenants in this uh, plot in the city center. So that uh, having apartments on top of houses was a typology developed spontaneously by them. They just couldn't achieve what we were identifying in that five design parameters. The quality of the urban space, the urban front structure for the final scenario, uh, but the density, for sure, was the main goal uh, that we were trying to share with them, just without overcrowding. We went through a series of workshops to try to agree on common rules of how expansions are go were going to take place. Sometimes big groups, sometimes smaller groups. The people that talk in bigger audience are not the same people that talk in when a smaller audience. And eventually, we wanted to identify more precisely what the needs for of specific communities were. We asked family leaders uh, to draw and write in workshops to try to verify if we were on the same page or not. We asked them to draw what they were getting uh, from, the, from the project about the facades or the growth always in the last place one would like it to happen <laughs> <laughs> or the common courtyards that we had no money of course uh, to treat at the very beginning but eventually were, there were some other resources out there in public policies that we were trying to identify so this is how they thought their housing project was going to look like. For the same amount of money, the market was producing this, and we were, tr we, this, we were competing against this. Uh, the main problem is not the box. Actually, if you will see afterwards, our design is not that different from that box, so there's not the architecture. What's worst about this is that these boxes are in the case of Iquique, which is a small city, 45 minutes away from the city, where poor are accumulated in a way where land tends to cost nothing, which is the case with Latin American peripheries. So we had to prove that for the same amount of money, this could be done. As you see, the concrete box is more or less the same one here, just another box vertical over here. Uh, but with that density, we were able to maintain the families within their network of jobs uh, and all the social networks that they built over decades. Because if that happened, we were confident that the process of very quick self-expansion was going to take place. Cost of the first half, the first 36 square meters, 
the, subs the voucher. In average, the cost of the next 36 square meters, $1,000. The reason? Structures and difficult parts of the construction were done by us. They just have to fill in the gap with non-structural <laughs> operations. Uh, actually, the width of that void is very important. Uh, how to define a width that is big enough so that the rooms you get are of middle income standard, that's what we call the middle income DNA, but not that big that it will require sophisticated building operations. Three meters is, is the case, it's not 3.1, not 2.9, three is the size where a steel piece uh, can be cut in two and there's no waste. Uh, wood is sold in Chile in three meters. Uh, actually, the panels of emergency housing are built in three meters. So uh, the process of self-expansion, in many cases, took about one afternoon. Families brought the panels of emergency housing and just put it inside the structure that was measured for that to happen. So this is what we were giving at the beginning, which was not easy in the sense that <clears throat> no pavement, no paint, no water heater, for example. This is the perfect case for media to come and say, are we delivering this for poor families in the country? This is a shame. But we, we agreed with families that to be able to pay for land or for structure, well, something has not to be done. What is that? Let's identify something that is, well going to, that is going to be relatively easy for you to do, like pavements or painting. Because if we pay for land and families keep their jobs, then the process of finishing will happen on their own. Middle income standard, to be able to fit a queen size bed inside the room. This is not the case in social housing. You can't imagine the amount of social problems that it creates not to be able to have intimacy in a room uh, for a main couple. Uh, so the room had to be big enough to be able to fit that type of bed. Again, something has to be not to be done to be able to pay for this. The typical case is the bathroom. In social housing, the, for let's say, this is what you get initially, the bathroom, and actually I forgot to mention that. At the beginning of the policy in 2001, with $7,000, we were asked to provide housing solutions that had bathroom, kitchen, living room, dining room, and one bedroom at least. In 30 square meters, you can't imagine the quality of each of those rooms. So we decided that, and actually this is expressed in what, this is a typical bathroom on social housing, 1.2 by 1.2 meters, with a, a shower, toilet, and uh, washing the hands, what's the name? Basin. So this is uh, what's given in the, in the market current conditions. But we thought that bathroom belongs to the half that a family won't be able to do good afterwards if we don't do design it better at the beginning. And definitely, this is not a middle income standard bathroom by no means. Not just because of its size, but also because it's close to the door of the property. None of us want to go to the bathroom in the front of the door of our properties. We would like the bathrooms to be where bedrooms are, you know, connected to the more private part. So actually, in the designs we were providing, even at the beginning we had no money for the bathtub, we had money only for uh, the shower as well. But the size and form of the bathroom allowed to replace that uh, shower by a bathtub easily and then mainly it was located in the second floor where we were expecting bedrooms going to take place after expansions. We thought that this was a bathroom that had the middle income standard. Of course, it looked oversized in a very tiny property at the very beginning. But that was the type of choices we were trying to agree with families and trying to convince uh, 
the Ministry of Housing of how to spend public funds. So, we were not really that conscious while, while doing this project, but afterwards we thought that in the end what we achieved was a density high enough to be able to pay for expensive land, so leave the families integrated in the network of opportunities that cities offer, which is not the case normally in Latin America, but a high density without overcrowding and still with the possibility of expansion. So this is the triad that we were trying uh, to then test in different locations, different sites of cities, different topographies, different weathers and climates. As you see, well, not, not always, but it can't be seen, 900 inhabitants per hectare in this case in Santiago. The first project we did in Santiago, it's a variation of the project of Iquique, uh, always with a house, underneath an apartment on top. You see in this case, because of the weather of Santiago, the roof belongs to the half that a family won't be able to achieve on its own, but always structure for the final scenario. In the case of Valparaíso, the port uh, one hour away from Santiago, topography is one of the main challenges. And actually, the problem of the topography was the solution to achieve even more density. Whenever you are in a sloped site, you have to compress the footprint of the building to diminish as much as possible uh, movements of, of soil. So you have to uh, reduce the amount of retaining walls. The more you, you reduce the footprint, the more you have to go high. The problem is how do you provide direct access with the up to the upper properties without having shared circulations, which we knew was one of the things to be avoided. In this case, the same slope is the way so that we can access directly <coughs> upper floors duplexes. In this case, it's one duplex on, duplex on top of the other, another variation of the project of Iquique that achieved even more density density that was necessary to be able to uh, pay for land that was in a middle income standard neighborhood 15 minutes away from the center of Valparaiso. Uh, uh, social housing projects are being built two hours away today. Then different variations of what is the minimum in this case, trying to achieve more cubic meters than square meters because of a, a rainy environment. <coughs> Again, uh, trying to understand the different conditions of self-construction. Uh, in this case, this is what was presented at the Venice Biennale last year. The workshops with the families were in a piece of paper. In this case, it was a workshop to try to achieve uh, uh, a common contract within the families, how they're going to treat their public space. And depending on what decide, what consequences that, that decisions, those decisions had at the urban level. This is not this one. This is just to introduce our first project outside Chile, in Mexico. <clears throat> Market in Mexico is providing this solution for $25,000, $30,000, more or less. Uh, a lot of money spent in architecture, colors, you know, decoration, and uh, that was the type of decisions that we were trying to avoid because we knew 
that if you give families six by six meters in the front, well, that has a very low capacity of maintaining quality over time. And very quickly, self-construction is going to begin to happen uh, without any guides and also without any help. I mean, out of the six walls that a room has, you have to build on your own five. Many families are waiting for this neighbor, neighbor to move first because if this one builds and then the other one builds, then you get the two walls for free. And so there's very perverse incentives of how to develop the urban space. On the other hand, we knew that the capacity of self-construction in Mexico was huge. This four-story building in a six-by-six six, uh, front yard. <coughs> we were also trying to go into what is called pie de casa, which is um, it's not offered by the market, not a system. It's not systematically provided by the government either, uh, which is a $8,000 unit program, uh, which gives 20 square meter units, five by four meters. Uh, so this was a neighborhood they were just about to deliver. Uh, I went there uh, last, a couple of months ago in January, actually, because the reason why we're working in Mexico is because we got a phone call uh, saying that they wanted to copy us if we had our designs patented. And if we said, of course we have, but I'm not going to fight you with you from Chile to Mexico, so if you, if you can want to copy us, just go. But I, we just think that you don't have exactly the same question. It's similar, but not exactly the same. So we went there uh, to try to know where to work. I'm going to show afterwards the project that we're building there. Um, and I went in, ger in January to try to get paid. And uh, I took a look at what the development of that, after, after a year, what happened with that community, and it looked like this. In any case, our proposal was the following. Let's say, even if it's not the Pia de Casa case, you know, 20 square meter, but let's assume we're going to be like the market, the middle income market uh, that you're following, 20. $5,000 that allows you to build 36 square meters, which is actually what's being provided today. With that, you get very difficult and expensive operations of expansion that have no control of the public space and then actually are built in such a way that the entire lot is built in the end. Uh, generating very serious problems or internal pollution and the very bad quality of life. So we said, why don't we go for this? Try to do the same 30 squiz, uh, 36 square meters just in two stories, occupying 50% of the lot, then leave the other half empty, and do the same thing along the street so that we always have a wall over here and then self-construction will happen just providing three out of the five faces that a room needs. In that case, with an empty courtyard in the back, we arrive to 72 square meters and then we can keep on adding quite a lot before having to sacrifice the quality of life within the lot. So this is the project that we end up developing for a, for a different, different niche, $20,000 unit, units, as I said, but always again. It's a variation of the Ikike project, again, house underneath, apartment on top. It should be done by uh, mid of this year. I'm going to skip this to leave something for the final discussion. But I'm going to keep with this uh, equation over here. The, the scale and magnitude of the process of urbanization of the world in the poorest countries uh, that is going to take place that will require us to build 
a 1 million people city per week with $10,000 per family for the next 20 years. The question is, all this that we have been doing can be done with a certain scale, at a certain speed. Can we do it massive and quickly? Well, to try to achieve speed, we're working on uh, a couple of prototypes of prefabricated cores uh, of infrastructure. There's been an historical criticism to social housing, which is in order to achieve efficiency and to lower cost, it tends to be monotonous and repetitive, creating very bad uh, urban environments. Well, when you have money for just half of the house, you can prefabricate without bad conscience. I mean, the more monotonous the first half is, maybe the better that half is going to be able to control the second half of which we cannot know the quality. The more neutral, dry, and, uh, and repetitive that first half, well, the more it works as a frame and as a support for self-intervention, which of course is great for costs. So this is one prototype of uh, uh, prefab uh, concrete panels um, for the Lo Espejo typology. And then we're also working in the other typology that, the, that we mainly work with, which is in a 4.5 meter wide lot, we are creating a 1.5 <coughs> meter wide infrastructural core in two stories with a kitchen, stair, bathroom, partition wall, which is structure, uh, fire, uh, produces the fire isolation, also acoustic isolation with the neighbors. Uh, in this case, we're also providing a water tank on top of it. Uh, many people have said that, well, this is uh, nothing new. I mean, this is the old uh, lots and services strategy of the 70s. It's just uh, in two stories and in the front of the lot. Exactly, and that's the point. To do it in two stories and in the front of the lot can provide some quality of the urban space in the future, provide the a structural frame so that individual performances happen in the air in between, air that costs nothing, we just pay for the land underneath, still dense enough to be able to achieve good locations within the city. And we know location is by far what affects more the value of land or the value of the properties in the future and by definition location won't be able to be changed by families afterwards. So this is a typology that we're working on, that depending on the amount of money, we expect to produce this core for about $5,000. So the more we work, the more we're trying to move backwards and so to have less and less money. And uh, hopefully, um, we're working now on a, on, a car, on a house we call it the aqueduct, that is mainly an infrastructure, hopefully to be able to provide solutions for $1,000. To achieve scale, not just speed, uh, what we're trying to do is that people answer the question themselves. So <clears throat> we've been working on an online catalog that we've called Two Elevated to Five, which is we identified five questions that are key to define which type of ty typology you should begin to work with. And if you're okay with that, you just download the catalog and keep on working on your own. With, that num with those numbers of the equation, we're not, we don't even pretend to try to uh, answer to that demand. So let's say you have five questions like weather, topography, typology, what standard are you looking for, and how, how much program do you want? Uh, and you just choose, let's say, a slope site uh, in a weather that is not rainy, uh, with the typology of individual houses or uh, two, two properties one on top of the other, depending on what you choose. Uh, in this case, it's the minimum standard. And that will produce and provide one of the 32 typologies that two elevated to five generates. And then also some image of, that, of how that typology, typology looks like. That typology, depending on what you're choosing, is a different typology. So. <clears throat> With both things, prefabrication and, and catalog, uh, we're trying to become more massive and try to answer more quickly. And that's what we're, uh, what we're working on uh, right now. Thank you so much.
Alejandro, thank you very much. Um, you've done miracles uh, with space. I have to do miracles with time. I have to get 25 minutes of Q&A up here, um, and also 25 minutes of discussion from the floor into 27 minutes. Um, so we're going to uh, try to do our best. Um, gentlemen, I just thought um, before we would uh, go over the ground rules of the Q&A for the audience, um, something to consider. It was fascinating watching um, the presentation. Um, and it brought to mind uh, just one question that was outstanding, and that would be for both of you. What would a basic code of design human rights look for? Um, and it's interesting looking at what was done at Atacama, all of your work, Ricky, as well. Um, if you could, there's a checklist of three, four, or five things that you would consider. I want to come back to that question. Um, we will open the question of floor, uh, to the floor momentarily. Um, just a couple of ground rules. Uh, First, uh, we would love it if people indeed ask questions uh, and did not uh, stand up and deliver a manifesto um, in the interest of time. That's absolutely key. Um, and uh, also, some people might be shy in the room. Um, I'm sure many are not. Uh, but I'd also like to um, have a bit of an incentive program as well. Uh, we've also set up a prefab building outside, um, and we're offering up the whole back catalog of monocles. So, the best question um, can have a choice of any one of our, uh, the first two years, and uh, I'm going to be monitoring that. But um, I thought I would um, open up to Ricky first, just with some reflections, um, and then we'll uh, open up to a broader discussion. Thanks very much. I mean, I was just reminding myself that it's been quite a few years that we've had an architect speak at the LSE, uh, and I think there are many reasons for that. Sometimes we find it difficult to connect uh, some of the issues that our profession uh, engages with with a broader audience uh, and um, it was very very clear why you're here today I mean I think you've uh, brought um, absolutely home what it is that I think the design profession needs to do to engage with one of the most important uh, issues uh, affecting all of us uh, today I mean they're just some phrases that you, you you flashed up I have to write them down just to remind you know which architect you get uh, Pitzker Prize or non Pitzker Prize uh, winning, who says uh, you can only afford half a house, which, uh, which ha half do you build? You know, that's a very important notion that you build the ground on the last floor. That a square is more efficient to overcome poverty. Uh, I mean, these are concepts which are right at the heart of the urban age uh, agenda, which is trying to relate physical form to social form. Uh, I, I think what is important to, uh, in a way, amplify slightly. Um, to even better understand uh, what uh, is the originality and importance of, of um, uh, Elemental's work is what's going on out there in terms of um, uh, global urban development. You all know the statistics, they were even flashed up there that at least half the world is living in cities and that uh, is likely to become something like 75% of the world's population in the next 20, 30, 40 years. In fact, Nick Stern the other night uh, one of our colleagues here at the LSC was absolutely clear uh, as he studies more and more the environmental uh, impacts on the, uh, and the risks and challenges of climate change that urbanization will actually increase. Now the question then becomes very simple. What, how, what do we make this stuff like? What do we make these cities like? And as we've toured uh, many cities from Mumbai to uh, Sao Paulo uh, uh, to uh, New York and London, what we've seen certainly is the emergence of at least two things. First of all, that what is being built more and more is, is places of difference, slums of great poverty, but also gated communities of great wealth. Uh, that cities more and more are becoming, uh, in the need to actually build housing for others, uh, not cohesive and not uh, inclusive. I want to come back to that in terms of the work you've done. I think the other thing to remember is that in uh, the area of the world which is growing fastest, which is Asia and Africa, something like 60 to 70 percent of that uh, development is actually totally informal and not, not organized. So again, some of the messages you gave to us today about how do you regularize that informality without creating the soulless sort of neighborhoods that uh, I think we've seen being built in the name of social housing in the last 45 years is, is I think, very real. And then the <coughs> third statistic to remind ourselves is that 75% of CO2 emissions in the world are actually created by cities. Therefore, the nature of the footprint of cities, whether they're sprawling out or whether they're condensed and compact 
um, is very, very uh, important to that. Now, if you take these as big issues and think what it is you've been saying, I think there are four quick points that I'd just like to reflect upon. Your work shows us that density is not only possible, but also beautiful. I mean, I was reminded as you were showing us that work of some of the um, code books that, in fact, uh, uh, my colleague Roger Zagolovich showed me many, many years ago uh, of the Georgian house builders here in London, basically building very, very, very simple units uh, which have uh, proven incredibly adaptable over time. But the notion that you actually can create um, models of urban form through the basic units that you've shown, which create density that bring people together, but also create relief in terms of the public space around them, I think is extremely uh, significant. The second point, which I think you've shown through your work, is the notion of resilience. The fact that built form is not <coughs> fixed. It needs to adapt uh, to time. I mean, just think of office buildings built six months ago, let alone two years ago, uh, which now need to be occupied by tenants who don't want to, uh, who don't have the, the money to move in. I think, again, of the Georgian House in West London, uh, uh, or uh, many other parts of sort of Victorian cities which uh, have adapted to waves of change from uh, family houses 150 years ago to student houses um, and apartments to now yuppie housing but what has remained the same? The actual individual unit and I think the notion that you're actually providing a very basic infrastructure which allows people to go up the social ladder and adapt their buildings accordingly is I think uh, frankly one of the few examples of that architectural thinking that I've uh, come across. The third point I would say, if the first two are to do with density and the second resilience, the third point I think is an extremely important and Richard Sennett has written an enormous amount about this, is the issue of complexity. Uh, that you need to create, and I think some of your built forms do, create the, the, the bones for increasing complexity of social relations around them. And that isn't a very easy thing to do because you can overdetermine uh, built form as in most of the sort of social housing projects that one sees. You talk about network of opportunities uh, which are actually uh, very evident to us in the forms that you've made. And I think the final point, being that I'm an urbanist and uh, interested in the relationship between the individual object <coughs> and uh, what is uh, around you, is that it seems to me that the intrinsic potential of the uh, housing units that you're proposing is that they have an urban vocation, they have an urban potential. You can't see these places easily turned into gated communities. I mean, even the process you described of engagement is important. Uh, the fact that most of these units, by definition, have front doors opening out onto a space rather than actually turning them back onto the city uh, is incredibly important. So I would say that uh, y this work responds to literally a global challenge uh, that if the profession and if the client bodies were to <coughs> respond to some of these issues, we would certainly go somewhere towards um, creating not a nightmare of more concrete uh, development, which creates this sort of very strong anti-urban feeling around the world, but <coughs> returns to in a way that very normal uh, quality of cities, that sort of subliminal quality of density, people come together to uh, live close to where they live, resilience that they can change, complexity over time, and that essential quality of actually making city. And I think that's why when we at the Urban Age came across your work introduced by uh, Alejandro, another Alejandro from Chile, we were um, understood that we were touching something important. So uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, sharing that with us and uh, hopefully that some of these ideas can be taken certainly outside this room to other countries around the world. I wanted to um, go to one of the first slides when we looked at Monroy which was the first proposal uh, which was the pitched roof house uh, and row after row of them. That's the dream and I'm wondering how do you change the dream and in terms of subsequent research did, has the dream actually changed for that community? Well, we, we actually, is, can you hear? Yes. Uh, we don't change the dream. We just do half of it uh, because we don't have enough money. I, I would say <clears throat> the pit roof and all this iconography make sense 
in, in environments where it rains. The first project, it's a desert, so it didn't make sense. And families having to n decide how to spend $7,500 knew exactly what was fine. And they immediately got that having a pit roof because it was just the dream was not as necessary as having a structure. Eventually, in the second half, if they keep their jobs, they have built bay windows, they have been arches, they have been you know, all type of iconography that we will never be able to uh, tailor in a way. And it's, it's their own expression. Actually, there are cases where we have had more money and families ask, ask uh, not to design everything because they want to finish their houses. That's, I always say that's fair enough. But the main thing is that uh, as soon as you begin to talk with families of issues like, okay, if we're going to agree if we're going to have fences or not, or where we're going to park the cars, or how we're going to expand. I mean, are we going to, going to be within the structure? I'm going to go outside the structure. If that affects the value of your own property, that has been, has been a major argument for families to actually ask people that have not followed the rules to demolish what they've done. The, the idea of their uh, property having the risk to <coughs> value less over time. So, and this is something I didn't mention, and it's very important. This is a policy that is uh, uh, property oriented. Families own their properties. Since they own their properties, the notion of they're going to leave to the next generation, to their children, something that what's more, it's so important they, they, that they, once they achieve they, an agreement of how they're going to perform individual uh, operations, they stick to that and they want to guarantee that that value will grow over time. And that very rarely depends, the value depends on the iconography, but more on location. So uh, a square meter of land is much more important than a square meter of, of house. Uh, depends on the structure so that individual operations are safe, economic, quick, cheap. Uh, it depends on the, on the DNA of the house. I mean, that won't be able to be changed afterwards over time. So we didn't want to control how the next half is going to happen, but for sure it's going to uh, appear uh, with all that iconography. We don't have, I would say that <coughs> we're very healthy in the sense that we have uh, engineers inside the company and uh, they don't care about the form. They just try to uh, see what makes more sense. I mean, this one is better than the other, not just different. Tell me, explain me, is this better? If this better, we'll go for it. If it's just different, mm -hmm. I don't care. Rick, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, I was in Singapore recently. <coughs> You open the Straits Times on a Saturday, you go to the real estate pages, and here you have property developments in Singapore being marketed as gated communities. Now, I'm not sure the last time I experienced a carjacking or a mugging in Singapore, but you're thinking, oh, is there going to be an invasion of pirates from Indonesia? Why are they building gated communities in Singapore? Now, is this, is it, you know, it, I mean, clearly it's, it's a great marketing tool, but again, I mean, how do, how do you change the dream at the other end of the spectrum? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think what we're struck by is that um, at one point the, a gated community is um, a real necessity. I mean, we have been to Mexico City, Sao Paulo, frankly, uh, Johannesburg. Uh, there are conditions there of violence for all sorts of reasons that we're not going to necessarily go into now, where the inward looking community with a fence. Uh, out, outside with uh, security gates is a necessity. We don't like that, but that's what's actually happening. There are other places like Singapore or Istanbul, where we're working on now, where it's actually to do with the style. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it just sells like a good fridge. I mean, it's, 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 it's like an image, so you might as well live in a gated community uh, out there. Uh, and I think those are issues that need to be addressed. I mean, it is interesting, after all, in this city, there are very few gated communities. Uh, the ones that were gated communities, the great estates of the 17th and 18th century, um, Bloomsbury, uh, Gro the Grosvenor estate, whatever, actually had their gates come down uh, n not that long ago in some cases. 
But what was important is that when the gates came down, so to speak, the city was seamless and continuous. And I think that's the biggest uh, uh, challenge or, or, or risk to us. Let me add something to that. I think it's extremely important, and mainly your last point, the urban vocation of this. Uh, let me tell you a story about this. Uh, we originally were designing, once the family said, we were smaller groups, condominiums. Specifically, this is a very technical thing, once you decide to go for a condominium, you decide your own loss, let's say, the distance between facades and the roads that you have to pave and, and all that. That, in principle, meant that we could decide more efficiently how to spend resources. If we decided to do a public road within the courtyard, then the distance between facades was more, the width of the street was more, we had to pave the street actually and spend the money in the street and not in the houses. At a certain point, somebody in a municipality, uh, that I have to thank still today, said, you know, the problem with condominiums is that you're not going to have the municipality to take out the garbage, to uh, re repave if something happened to the street, or replace the public lighting. So, why don't you do a type of condominium that is like a globe. You have a street that penetrates this collective space, and this is the point, collective space, that is going to be maintained by the municipality, but that in fact will be closed by the families so that they control who comes in and out for security reasons as well. The thing is, the important thing here was to introduce in between the public and the private space, which is a kind of bi binary uh, tissue, uh, the one that uh, uh, conforms our peripheries, we introduced an intermediate level of association, which is the collective space, which in poor environments, it's very important. The notion of an extensive family, it's key to survive in this poor environment. So, once you achieve scale, to have a couple of neighbors taking care of children that are within that space, so that both parents can go out for work and don't have to remain at home because eventually if you get a subsidy, all the social network was broken. Uh, so if you can introduce a space where that extensive family can be recreated, if not maintained as it was originally generated, then you just introduce there some public space that can be maintained, but then that can be controlled as if it was private. So it's a very interesting dynamic that goes back and forth trying to uh, balance what's private, what's public, and what's the level of associa association that can be achieved in these environments. Ricky, in the case of Istanbul's Kuala Lumpur, Singapore's, where does the discussion have to start and end, uh, let's say, to prevent gated communities where they're, they're certainly not needed? Is it, is it an education roadshow? with the developers, uh, or it really has to happen uh, at a local government level? Well, first of all, I don't think you can intervene in that way. And, and um, uh, it's like talking uh, about the, the desire for uh, several million uh, Chinese to not use bicycles but use cars. I mean, you're, you're, you can't actually intervene in that process. The issue is that to design environments uh, in the case of uh, bicycles or cars, which are not uh, dependent on a particular sort of moment or uh, perhaps even ideology. In the case of the gated communities, uh, I, I, I think um, in a way you have to let things happen and then see that uh, over time people lose something that they thought they had in a city. I mean, it is, it, again, it is interesting to see how in many Western cities there's been uh, a process over time where um, people who've abandoned, usually the middle class, the city centers, are now beginning to come back. I mean, within walking distance from here, not only LSE uh, professors, but also uh, normal people uh, live <laughs> um, uh, and uh, with their families because they can walk to school, to work, and everything else. The MP, M MT Nessus are. Now, I think that the more uh, you build cities which are diverse or brittle, as uh, Richard Sennett calls them, uh, the more people will lack that uh, quality that cities have always had, uh, and only then will there be a full cycle. Unfortunately, I don't think you can just talk to planners or talk to developers. I, the only thing you could do is talk to a planning authority and impose a regulation which does not allow uh, uh, 
buildings not to face the street or to have gated walls around them. But, you know, there is such a thing as democracy. Do you think people in South Florida are, are buying into this and leaving their gated communities? That who are? In South Florida. I mean, if I look at all of the gated communities... I was up talking about the real world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fully agreed. I mean, not golf resorts <laughs> for, you know, rich New Yorkers. I mean, it's another. But is a reality. The case in, um, I mean, certainly within Chile, but I mean, in the broader sense in, uh, I mean, in Latin America, what are you seeing? Regarding yeah. who to, who, where to start from? Yes. I would say the market. I mean, that's the only way, that's the way we started. I mean, there was a policy, there was money out there. So with that, you can, if you think there's a way to go for that, and then there's going to be people wanting to follow that, uh, we just follow the market. We didn't ask anybody, no, no politician, no NGO, no municipality, not even developers. There was a system out there and we used the system. Uh, within that set of rules, there were some degrees of freedom. Actually, because there were rules, there is freedom. Actually, if, if not, it, it's impossible. The thing is that <clears throat> once you go for that, um, what, we th what we found was really missing was not the money for building this, but the money for the chain of professional work required for this to achieve some quality. I mean, if we leave out ideology, out there, I mean, go and escape the, the debate of should city be more dense or less dense, um, with a bigger footprint or a small footprint, with urban highways, without highways. If we abandon that and we just concentrate on the conditions to understand those conditions requires high quality professional work. And if there's something missing, is that amount of time required to understand the set of constraints and to produce an answer that normally requires innovation because, ans because the questions tend to be new. We don't want to innovate for the sake of innovating. I mean, after the PowerPoint, it was clear there was an innovation required because the market couldn't answer that. And for that, you need time. Nobody pays for that time. None of us in Elemental is a hero. We want to get paid for what we do. Uh, we just need a chain of quality. And we've found that that is what has suffered the most to produce poor urban environments, not just for the lower classes, but also for the upper classes. I mean, you tend not to have time to guarantee that quality of professional work if you set ideology uh, apart. So do you think there needs to be a basic code which is imposed at, well, at a federal level to make that happen when you talk about quality? We've been trying to subsidize ourselves, to try to partner with the Chilean oil company, to trying to use universities as a way to work with certain uh, field underneath our field. Uh, we have tried everything. and. Uh, in the end, the answer is, uh, well, all of them. Uh, I would say it, uh, it, it, we're still not there. I mean, it's a very precarious thing. We have just built 2,000 units, for example, and uh, we're, we're on the process to build more, still far away from what's enough. And uh, the more you build, the more efficient you become. Eventually, we're going to uh, uh, be able to provide for the chain of, of professional work uh, better salaries and fees. Mm. It's very important, and that's why we're trying to develop these prefabric prefabricated prototypes. Not just we want to move fast, but, but once you produce things, not just knowledge, things, eventually you create some money to be able to keep on thinking about this, these things. Uh, so to be able to sell, sell things and not just services, I guess, is another way uh, to move forward. But I would add one thing, Tyler. I mean, in most of the cities uh, that we're talking about in terms of the high levels of growth, something like 60 or 70 percent is in totally informal. So the notion of which regulatory authority to go to when there is no regulation is really not, not sure. in a way, not, not, we can't really say much about it. On the other hand, the sort of examples of what you showed, just where, where there are conditions of subsidy, which is clearly happening increasing around the world, um, that it can be applied in a way that it actually creates something which is adaptable, mm. resilient, etc. I think that's an extremely interesting model, which will probably be even picked up, could be even picked up by local residents who just copy exactly what has been done next door. So I think that's, uh, I, I think the top-down model doesn't work. Mm. 
I think you would have been astounded if anyone lives in Marylebone. There was a public consultation yesterday for that lovely piece of land where the farmers' market is. Uh, you know, which the proposal calls for. You know, do we really need a Waitrose now, which is triple the size? And you see the solutions for housing, and you sort of think maybe top-down does need to happen as well. But anyway, I'm going to um, open it up to questions from the floor. Um, I believe there's two microphones. Uh, I think one on each aisle. Um, it'd be great. Um, first question, there's a question down here. Um, if you could just state your name and uh, where you're from. I think there's a blue sleeve went up right. Oh, you don't? No, there's another blue sleeve right there. Uh, my name is Paulo Câmara and I work in London, but I originally am from Brazil. Uh, my question is a very practical one. How long could it take for this units to be built? And where did the families relocate during the construction period? Because it's a very kind of crucial where they go and stuff. Just in case everyone didn't hear the question, it was how long did the schemes take to be built and also where were the families uh, relocated to during the construction period? Alain. Okay, it depends uh, on the legal complexity of sites. The most amount of time is taken so that you can go into a property that is legally healthy and in the best cases we've been waiting for two or three years before that happens. I mean if the site is already uh, clean then construction takes what any contra construction takes, nine months, ten months. <coughs> there are cases where families are within the site and have to be relocated temporarily somewhere else. That's a very important reason for why to go for, for prefabrication. If we go for prefab, knowing that we're prefabbing just half of the house, we can reduce the time to four months. Another reason for, for prefab, when you have scarce resources, particularly in social housing, the only way to meet cost tends to be identified with lowering the physical quality, the construction quality of the, uh, of the buildings. If you reduce time, then you're not paying financial and general cost of contractors. If you can lo uh, lower the time to four months, eventually it's something accept acceptable if families uh, have to be temporarily uh, be uh, displaced from where they were, but there are many cases, and and this is the the main uh, the mainstream. Let's say well, it's the rule, not the exception, where by being able to pay three times more money for a piece of land that what socially can, social housing can normally afford, in the case of Santiago, ten thousand hectares appeared to be available. Uh, in the city. So we were just doing as any other developer would do. I have this amount of money and buy uh, land that originally was impossible to be paid with social housing. If that's the case, you try to identify pieces of land that are as close as possible where families are so that you keep those uh, networks they've created. In many cases that had happened across the street. Thank you. Um, also, two questions. One is, um, I'm Sunan Prasad, I'm president of the RIBA at present. Um, two questions. I really appreciated you talking about replicability, that you follow certain patterns, which means that whatever is done is replicable. So the question is, have they been replicated? What is the, and are they likely to be replicated? Uh, because it seems like a, such a penetrating insight into what might be done. The second question is, could you say something about the public realm and the public facilities that <coughs> might be associated with, uh, especially when over a certain scale you, you get uh, agglomeration of those, those dwelling units? Yes. Uh, well, <coughs> first of all, it has been replicated, yes. It started with a Kike project, 100 families in 2003. Uh, once we became a company in 2006, our board of directors asked, okay, now we're writing all our checks on 100 families example. So we need to uh, make this explode. So from 2006 until today, we went from 100 to 2000. But mainly what we're trying to do is to work outside Chile, where money is less, and I think it's, we're more efficient with less money. In, in Chile, uh, now we're too rich in a way. Uh, 20,000 units, uh, it's too much for this. I mean, this works better with $10,000, and so we're trying to replicate it, it outside Chile. It tends to work. Has anybody else done what you've done? 
somebody else? Not that we know uh, yet. Uh, I think this is t still too too small and too unknown. Uh, and actually, uh, I'm having a conversation tomorrow with with Cecil Balman because uh, there's a book of Simon and Schuster on, on innovators, and uh, I write, wrote him an email back that was we were very flattered and fantastic, but. To be called an innovator, it's great for the ego, very bad for business. Uh, because as soon as you come with something new, people are afraid. I mean, construction and building market is one of the most conservative markets in the world. So you, tr you better try to say, you know, we're not mm, doing anything new. This is this thing that has been done the same way from the 70s on. And we, so we, try, we have to try to communicate it that way. It's very much connected to your initial question of how universal this is. And uh, when you reduce the problem to such a basic unit, to such an, an elementary unit, we've found out there were all the warnings and saying, yeah, okay, but maybe this is okay for, for Chile. Uh, but then when we moved to Mexico, uh, we were even wanting to, to make something different. It proved to be pretty much the same. And so you, when you begin to move around, you find that when you've reduced your problems to such a basic core, that's pretty much universal. I mean, Marguerite Jusenar, the, the French writer, says that a comfortable stare, it's still the same one uh, as Romans had, because we still have the same toes. Once you re reduce the problem to such a universal problem of how many ways are there to go to the bathroom? I mean, not too many. The, the second part. <laughs> The cultural part, let's say the weather, the climate, the topography, tends to adjust naturally with the second half, which is by definition something we're not doing. So even if we're very stupid, people are going to correct our mistakes with the second half of the house. So I would say that in the problem of not having money, there was a solution uh, for becoming as universal as possible. That's one thing. The other one, the other question was regarding public. the public. It, it is very important that by trying to achieve enough density to afford expensive pieces of land, what we're trying to do is to benefit from a city that already has all those services. So our first approach is try to be in a city that already has the school, the transportation, and the, all, all that. And we all know, of course, that that's, that costs more. So that's one way. The other way is that by, have, by achieving enough density, you are able to reduce your footprint and compared to conventional parameters, you are able to accommodate, when that's required because of the scale, school, social centers, uh, uh, commercial strips, uh, because a developer doesn't have to choose if that's the case. There is a, a specific problem, though, in the Chilean policy that trying to avoid you know, those big masses of monotonous uh, uh, housing uh, developments of uh, thousands of units reduce the maximum amount of units that you can do at a time to 300. It was well intentioned in principle. The problem is that in, with three, 300 units, big building companies are not interested. So the quality and the fragility of who's building these units, it's so high that, okay, you might get pieces that are more uh, differentiated one from each other. But what you lose is that public realm. That has to be coordinated with other ministries and actually just to, to mention that because I'm not going to be able to explain the reason why I showed at the beginning public space, uh, infrastructure, we're working on schools as well, we're a conventional architectural office as well, is that whenever it's possible Reduce the footprint so there is space to provide for that. Funding is not going to be coming from the Ministry of Housing. But we know that cities can be used as a vehicle to create, to create wealth for a certain elite that has to be inclusive with the shortcut towards equality, which is the other end that we're working on. So Sorry. we're trying to combine both. Sir, you have a question there. For preservation of naturally um, older areas, let's say London, Paris. But my question is sometimes, do people really want social housing to appear next door to some of these preserved areas? 
And I see that in a place like Paris, where you have this strong push to keep everything static and exactly the same as it was. And so do you come across that, either one of you, do you come across that kind of uh, issue? And how do you respond to that? Okay, do you want to jump in? Or? We haven't had that issue of history or context or... Uh, because Chile doesn't have history, it's a... Uh, I mean, earthquakes tend to erase kind of old things. Uh, so when you said, okay, this building is very old, it's more than 90 years old, then that's what we get, more or less, as, a, as context. What we found, though, is existing middle-income communities that get uh, social housing of the poor, let's say, that do not want to be affected by, uh, in principle, uh, this more conflicted co communities. Since we tend to give a solution to people where they are, the thing is that right now, in the way they are, they're, they're creating a, you know, a, a, a spawn of very <coughs> negative qualities. That as soon as a new project comes in, the value property, not just of the neighborhood that we're building for, but of the entire neighborhood, goes out. Actually, the people in, in Iquique that received, I mean, they were in a middle income uh, environment that to the UK standards would look, I mean, extremely poor. Well, that for us was middle income. When the people got these new houses, they begin to complain about the neighbors that were papers there because they were affecting the value of their property. So they asked them to uh, begin to make better with the, their public realm so that all of them could benefit from that. So what tends to happen with context has more of a social issue more than a historic, uh, pre-existing, uh, yeah. Great, so we, sir. Uh, I have a particular question. Klaus Bode is my name. I'm a director of BDSP Partnership with Environmental Consultants. Um, you've already partly answered my first, a two-part question. One was whether, how far you believed your design was a universal solution, because there's always a big stigma attached to is there such a thing as a universal solution? You've extrapolated your idea to macro scale about cities and growth and population. Um, how far, my first element, do you generally believe this is a universal solution cross-bridging different cultures and religions? If you go start looking at Africa and Cairo, Lagos, other countries, do you really believe this is the solution? And linked to that comes my part, is it therefore product or process driven? So is it your process that leads to a solution, or is it the product? Because the Mexican solution, the Chilean, I really liked it, but I think there is a similarity from, maybe I don't know enough about Chilean and Mexican culture, but religion, etc. I've certainly found, traveling around the world, that certain elements, including where you put your toilet, is very, very different depending where religions come into place. I'm just curious about that. Well, <clears throat> if we're... If we're able to do something for Latin America, I think it's universal enough. And mm -hmm. if I genuinely believe, yes. Uh, we try to be very careful in trying to identify what the difficult half is. Uh, it's not always the same half. I mean, even within Chile, being a 5,000 kilometer country, would, what is a half, a strategic half in the north, has nothing to do with the half in the south. Still, the principle is the same. Roof and uh, envelope, let's say, is the case for colder environments, pure structure, and then hopefully more uh, uh, square meters at the beginning is the case for a desert. The thing is, what is that difficult half in, in every case? That tends to uh, be conditioned by culture, by weather, by science, by, uh, by market in the end. Until now, because of the scarcity of resources, the way you have to synthesize and reduce that half has proved. I mean, that's why we came to a catalog seven years afterwards. I mean, not at the beginning, at the end, because we systematically found when trying to give an answer, all these uh, choices in the end proved to be able to be answered with not too many typologies, too elevate, elevated to five. So, as a matter of fact, it's a conclusion, the catalog, uh, of the process where we have found. 
It might be cases that are not this, oh, for sure, but with two billion poor coming to the cities, I mean, uh, even if we do great, there should be so many other people needed to give answers to this question uh, that we don't even dare uh, to approach that level of universality. universality. This is the pro process of the product. Both of them have been trying to be uh, to achieve a more systematic approach. For the working with the communities, we do have a protocol now that we recommend. Say it's built out of ten workshops. Three of them before starting design. Uh, first one, just meet the community and, and tell your name and, and be sure you're, 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 you can enter the communities. Second one, let's talk about the problem that we've got. What do you expect? What's the amount of money? Participation is mainly about communication of constraints and information more than asking how would you like a house. Uh, third one, to try to well, we think that uh, the answer is going to be more or less in this direction. Never talk about square meters, uh, te talk in terms of rooms, because if you need to adjust the cost and you say a number, your families will never forget the number and then you're going to be, not, uh, uh, going to be creating false expectations. During, during construction, you use the construction itself to do more workshops and so that has come. Uh, to a protocol that we recommend. Of course, we haven't been able to test that in hands of others. But by nature, architecture is done with the hands of others. I mean, I'm not building the, the things. I'm, I'm always part of a team. So I would say, if our discipline cannot, cannot achieve universality, then I don't know which one can. We have just one last question. We're about 15 minutes over, but you can rush the stage afterwards if you like. Um, Ma'am. Uh, Ziona Strelitz from ZZA. Um, have you seen any preferences manifested for the ground floor units and the upper floor units? Um, is there a strategy for dealing with disabled access other than accommodating people on the ground floor? And have you explored in your catalogue development a module for the core that incorporates um, access for disabled people? We were very scared in our first project having one third of the units on the ground floor, two thirds in the upper floor. How uh, families are, were going to distribute uh, the, the units. We found that one of the things, and that's one of the workshops, we gain nothing by deciding who is going to live where. It's up to them to decide how they're going uh, to uh, choose the properties. If we go back to the question of extensive families, normally what you get is that parents or older people that are the parents of the second generation choose to be neighbors. So the daughter and the son are upstairs or a new family is upstairs, then the grandparents are in the ground floor. So in the end, it's like a big house, not 72 square meter houses. There are 150 square meter houses with this notion of broader, uh, broader notion of extensive family. What we, what we thought was the key and actually, this was the response of the families, is that if you give an apartment that has all the, con the good conditions of middle income standard apartments, like if you're up, it's safer, you get the views, you get air, you get light, then you choose it. I mean, if there, is, there is, a is there a place to dry, uh, uh, to wash clothes and, and being able to dry them outside? Yes, there is. Okay, then that's fine. If, that's, if those are the conditions for the, for the apartments, I'm okay with that. There's not an a priori uh, rejection of the apartments because they are apartments. It depends a lot on the conditions. The same thing for the house underneath. Eventually, people with animals choose, with, uh, uh, choose the house, or with disabilities, or with a car, or people that have a shop that one that they run at home. I mean, actually, they, those tend to choose properties that are facing the street because they do have a, uh, a sewing machine or a, or a, a, mini, a small market at home. All that diversity tends, can be, it's part of the agreements that community achieve on their own. And the only thing that we've found is that the discussion is on the conditions 
not about the fact that it's a house or an, or an apartment. Great. Um, I think Sarah's going to have a few words. The gentleman from Marylebone Mansions, you can go and collect your magazine uh, up to the left-hand door when you leave. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're running seriously over time, but I just want to take a couple more sentences to um, thank various people. The LSE prides itself on running provocative public events programs. And I mean provocative in the sense that we want to put before you ideas that challenge you and make you rethink your general assumptions. Now to do that we do need a particular sort of audience. We need an audience that is quite clever and prepared to react in that way. And I want to thank you for being that sort of audience. But of course we need speakers who will generate that kind of response. So can I ask you to thank our three speakers who have done, I think, just that. <laughs>